A past master videographer, friend of the show, and ultimate outdoorsman, Jake Latondras, joins me once again, where this week we talk about those dirty, rotten, filthy walleye cheaters and shortcuts in life. This week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. And I hope you're having a good week. It is hump day. That's when you find this show week after week. And we are thankful that you have found your way here this week. And um, I'm really thankful to say my buddy is back this week. You know him from Jake's take. Jake LaTondris, um, become a friend of the show. Well, was a friend of the show before he was even on the show. But you guys are pretty used to Jake's take on things. And uh, this one's going to be a little different because me and Jake haven't talked in a little while. We're not coming home from an event, but there's no shortage of craziness going on in the fishing industry. And uh, one of the big topics this week, by everything that talks about fishing and things that never talk about fishing, which is what frustrates me most, to be honest. And what I'm talking about is the filthy, dirty, rotten cheaters that were busted shoving eight pounds of lead inside a limit of walleye um, to win a tournament. Well, they were busted in one of the craziest videos ever. Um, kudos to everybody involved that 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 they caught these guys. Um, but what really frustrates me is I have no idea who won the tournament. I have no idea who even was fishing against these guys. That's the gross part about the world. Fox, um, CNN, everybody, literally every website, Barstool, everybody is talking about these cheaters. I mean, the amount of different like mainstream podcasts that have asked me to come on this week, but I'm traveling this week and I can't do a lot of them, um, blows my mind. But it's all from something negative towards our sport, which is what is wrong with the world. Because if the story was that these guys won their 10th tournament in a row or something like that, there wouldn't be any media about it. But the world sees them cheating and now everybody is talking about it. And it's quite honestly something you're going to have to put up with. If you're passionate about the sport of competitive fishing, which I assume you are if you listen to this podcast, you're going to have to put up with this for the rest of your life or for a long time. You're going to hear, you know, whether you go to, you know, somebody's birthday party and you're standing around and you meet some dude and he starts talking to you. Say, what do you do? I fish tournaments. All of a sudden, you're going to hear about these two idiots. And thank God they got caught. And um, But it's just gross. It's just really, really gross. Because it's going to make a lot of good, hardworking people put them under a negative light and put them up with something that they shouldn't have to put up with. I mean, right now, we should know the names of the people that legally caught the walleye, that legally won those tournaments. But instead, we just are all talking about those two idiots, and we're no different because we're going to talk about them. But um, I guess my message is spread, sp spread happiness and positivity as opposed to hatred. I mean, I, I was this podcast made a big change over those very reasons. Life is too short to be negative and nasty. Be positive and happy, but... Um, one dude that always gets me positive and happy is our guest this week. And without waiting any further, let's bring up a man who has seen more than 64 Grateful Dead concerts. A man who is often one of the only other human beings to see what really goes down in a Bassmaster Elite Series event. A man who decided that not just climbing mountains, I mean, that's challenging for some but he'd rather be an ice climber. My buddy, my pal, the host of Jake's Take, the one and only Jake Latondras. I am so happy to have you back. Jake Latondras, welcome back to the <laughs> podcast. It's been a long, long, we said we'd have you on about once a month, and it's been a month, so you're back. 
That was the longest month of my life, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> that went by that went by way too slow I, not only do i miss being on your podcast i just miss talking to you yeah we haven't talked a lot in this little break because both our schedules have kind of been opposite it seemed like when you were at an event i wasn't and vice versa when you weren't i was um but yeah lots of lots is going on in the fishing world and uh none of it seems to matter anymore though you know like <laughs> it, it it's like that old i don't even want to start off the podcast with saying it's like that old saying but um one thing goes wrong like i mean fishing has never had more media more attention than we've seen this last few days i mean fishing's been on fox cnn espn you know uh barstool everyone yeah everywhere I hate it. What, 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 okay, first of all, what are your initial reactions? That, like when when you first heard about it, what went through your mind? Well, let's address what's oh, going oh, okay. on okay. here. Yeah, uh, yeah, that I'm horrible. I'll let you ad job. address address the title of today's topic. The title of today's topic is just how much lead can you shove inside a walleye? Uh, Have you seen uh, all the memes coming out? Oh, it's so. Oh my it's, goodness! There's so many memes. I mean, bass fishing has never cared about walleye fishing more in their life than this. Um, the, the Kaminsky rig. <laughs> so basically, these two dudes um, in Ohio, walleye tournament anglers, and guys that had been suspected. I mean, the story now coming out is all the dudes that compete against them, uh, not just dudes. I'm sure some ladies have fished there too. They had all been for a long time kind of bitching about that there's something these guys are doing. Um, but they got busted. Literally, they literally, while I do not have to be live when weighed in, that's the biggest difference. First in of some all, tournaments. In some, some tournaments. tournaments. A lot of tournaments they are, but on the Lake Erie, I talked to a lady that lives up there in Port Clinton. I bet you and did. And she explained this to me. She told me that, <laughs> she told me that, <laughs> The Lake Erie events, a lot of them now, there's so many walleyes in the system that they want to increase the harvest. So they yeah. allow these tournaments to have walleye kill, uh, kill fish tournaments, which this was. And to me, that just sets a disaster. That's got disaster written all over it. And, and as it would be, that's exactly what happened. I mean, yeah. They went to weigh in their fish and they did. They took the lead, basically, I guess. And um, I listened the to the lead. tournament director. Took the lead. Well, they, no. freaking ex they, they imploded the second place team. <laughs> <laughs> well, but they also took the, the what they were trying to win was Angler of the Year because they came into that event leading our team sure. of the year. Sure. Um, so, regardless, whether it be the lead of the tournament or whatever, I listen to the tournament director on Ike's podcast, which if you haven't listened to it, go listen to it. His name's uh, Jason Fisher. And he's like, I looked at the bag and I figured they, he knew they need to finish in top 10 to lock up team of the year. And top 10 was around 16 pounds. Cause it was really bad conditions. He said, so when he saw the bag of fish, he figured, Oh, they've got 21 to maybe 24 in there. And then he weighed in 33 pounds. Um, so that was his first kind of clue. And he says right away on stage, kudos to him. He says right away on stage, he says, keep those fish around. We need to get some pictures. We need to get some pictures. So, so, so smart to not let, let them, them just take kind of off. take off. But how weird and awkward is it to be him? I mean, MC in an event and in his head, he's like, I think they, they finally caught these guys. Like there's something up here. Um, and the, so, so I'll let you talk now, Jake. We most people have known about this story. If you don't know about it, pretty sure everybody that's tuned in here, if somebody didn't hear about the walleye cheaters before this podcast, please in the comments let us know because what the hell have you been up to? Yeah, <laughs> so like you, mean, you turn on a computer and it's there. Oh, just look at your phone. Someone's yeah. sending you a link, or I mean, it was insane. It's like Mark Mark Daniels Jr. said <laughs> on that little uh clip that Ike had on his show to promote uh that interview with Josh. Uh or was it's Josh Jason, Josh, I think. Or Jason. Jason. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, Jason. Uh Mark Daniels Jr. says, if someone sends me one more link to that walleye thing. <laughs> so the guy's names, I'm just gonna say them because 
first of all, I want to address the fact that it's disgusting. What they did mm-hmm. is absolutely freaking disgusting. I don't like liars, cheaters, or thieves in the first place. And those guys are all the above liars, cheaters, and most importantly, in my opinion, thieves to the people that they've been competing against for however long they've been cheating. They have stolen, not only stolen money and prizes and sponsorships and notoriety and all those things, parts of people's careers. They've stolen, they've stolen people's dreams over this. Yeah. And and that to me is disgusting. So I'm gonna say their names. As I recall, it's Chase Kaminsky and Jake Runyon. Those are the two anglers that were caught cheating. And when I watched the first video. Like the first time I saw it, I was like, what is this? This is weird. (laughs) And, and they had, let me go back. You, you know, they, 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 they they weighed 33 pounds of walleyes and you could tell none of those walleyes look like they were over five pounds, maybe five and a half. It's hard to tell on video, but they certainly weren't eight pounders. And, and in walleye events, they weigh four fish because typically on most walleye systems, the personal daily bag limit is for four walleyes to keep. So that's, that was their deal. Right. So in, Thank in God United you're here States. for the details. Yeah. So as, as this started developing, you know, the, the, the tournament directors cutting these fish open and he's popping well, egg weights well, out. Go but ahead. it did. I mean, if you haven't seen the video, I mean, it didn't just happen. It was at the side of the stage, the way in had completed, and he said on Ike's show, he said, I, I started feeling the gut and he could feel something hard. And so that's what pushed him to, to grab said knife and um, slice him and dice him. I digress. And, continue. and there were people in the crowd, you know, com- wooing and woeing, not because of their weight, because it was so much and, and it was mind boggling they were wooing and wooing in the fact that these guys have a history of suspect weights and tournaments, particularly killfish tournaments. And the, the, the anglers in the crowd were going, there's no way that's 33 pounds of fish. Yeah. And ironically enough, if you took, you know, they found eight pounds of lead and, and in the fish total, plus they were filleting walleyes on the boat and stuffing lot stuffing fillets of other fish into these fish. Like yeah. this is yeah. just totally premeditated. And and so if you subtracted eight pounds from 33, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I'm just doing the math based on what I know. If you subtract eight pounds from 33, they would have had enough weight to win the tournament anyway. Yeah. Right? Like yeah that, what a joke <laughs> uh, they and the crazy thing is like this isn't new like this has been going on for there's been a group of anglers that have said these guys are cheating these guys are cheating over and over again and the crazy thing is they actually did it once on camera like recently they put a camera in their boat and they were you know do, doing coverage and somehow nobody knows how the tournament director on Ike show said we don't know like it'll all come out hopefully at some point, but they don't know how it possibly happened with a camera person. Like is the camp, was the camera person bought off was the camera or they able to do it? You know what I mean? Like a big walleye, a weight like that, literally you'd be shocked how quick. And I only know this because when you get a bait fish or something like that, that a fish goes to spit out and a big bait fish and you go to put it back in its mouth, it's almost like a reverse like same thing when you shove your finger down your throat and you go, Bleh. I do that to my wife all the time. Just see my, oh, wow. This sounded horrible when I said <laughs> uh, what I meant is I make that noise Bleh. and that makes my wife want to throw up, which is a lot of fun around my house. Um, my buddy Gooch too. I can also, I'll call him and just make sound. He hears that. And Bleh. if he's watching right now, he's throwing up. I hope none of you are, but back to my story. If you take said pig bait fish, how bad did that get? quick <laughs> and you put it it almost has a reverse thing where it gullets it down so i don't think it would take as long to shove big weights down a walleye's throat were they I agree. ballsy enough to do it you know like i'm gonna go back and check on the fish camera guy's busy with the other angler or whatever 
Did they do it with them? Did they do it when he got off the boat? But they got away with this once, or or they clearly can also catch walleye. Did they win that tournament clean? It's nuts. I mean, an egg weight is, if you think about it, they had to think about this a oh. lot, a lot, because there's so many different ways, I suppose, a person could cheat. And, and they had to think this through. And the, the, I mean, the whole walleye fillet, when he started pulling walleye fillets out of, out of those fish, when he was cutting them open, I was like, you have got to be kidding me. These guys went the extra mile. I mean, I, like you said, I'll bet the egg weights just slipped right in. They could just push it through and it was in because they're round. They're, they're smooth. They're weighted. Weighted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just hold them upside down and go, blam, you know? And it's like, it's like giving a, 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 a dog a pill. <laughs> You know what yeah. I mean? And Same you deal. Shut its mouth, and all of a sudden they swallow, and it's down. And so, I don't even know what to say about it, man. That was that was, you know, the first. I was waiting when I first watched the video. I thought, okay, this is about to get violent. These guys are going to jump these anglers. And to 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 the tournament director's credit, he and apparently there was a U.S. marshal that was in the crowd that was, that can't, he was, he was an angler in the tournament or participant. And he came up to the tournament director and said something to him. And as I understand it, I don't know for, for a fact, because I'm just a social media, you know, termite, just like everyone else is. But from what I understand, he told him to call the police and not let those guys don't let any violence occur because this could get really ugly, really fast. And you know, the adrenaline and testosterone and the rage that was going through these other anglers at the time was like, just ready oh. to implode, implode. I, I wish I had a better analogy. So I'll just use the best one I've heard. And it came from Brian, the carpenter. It was like a South park scene. It literally was like the stuff that people were yelling. Just imagine that dude is standing there. One of them, Evidently, I and I don't know which one was which. I had Jake heard it was, Runyon was the guy standing by the basket. He he was the guy standing by the basket, and Chase uh, Kaminsky, I, I guess, was already Chase out of ironically the scene. ran. Chase, yeah, <laughs> Chase ironically yeah. fleed the situation. So so ironic. Uh, but he stood there, and I mean, of course, you're gonna be, and they, they just get closer and closer. This group of guys just yelling, "You're a cheater! You're this!" And and one by one, and the tournament director, I mean, dude, went straight WWE, which you know I love. Uh, oh. But when he pulled the first he went wave, Randy Savage on him, dude. <laughs> well, but also like part of his thing, and and man, I feel for him is. He's been put through the ringer by these guys, it, not just these guys, but the amount of guys that are calling him for over a year now saying they're cheating, they're cheating. And they've tried things. They put cameras in their boat and they've never caught him. And to finally catch him because he had said, he said, I got to their side. You know what I mean? I was like, they're just getting, they're just getting hate for being good because I mean, they did it on camera. How can it, but when he finally, you know, cut in there and pulled that weight out there, he said like, I couldn't control him. And you can feel like the passion of, you know, when he said, we got lead weights in them. <laughs> I mean, oh, that goodness. group of anglers, like the henchmen, they showed up. And um, I wonder if, the, what do you think will happen with them legally? I, I bet you it doesn't I end don't up being near There's, as bad as it should be. I agree with you, but I've heard, you know, there are attorneys that have, that have spoken up on social media and some of their comment sections and whatnot. I don't know any of these people and, who knows what the truth is or what's really going to happen, but you know, there's there, the fraud is a criminal yeah. offense, but like, how do they go back and prove the past tournaments, whether they were, can they, can they, can they put a polygraph? They did pass a polygraph test. One of them. Or, failed no, no, one, they though. failed it. They one failed of them it, passed yeah. and the other one failed. So that's where, but they couldn't do much with them at that point. I guess they got kind of, it, they left a tournament. They were DQ'd out of a tournament that they would have won 145 more grand from, I, from what I've heard. Everything we're saying today, just for the record, is allegedly, okay, yeah. because we don't yeah. really know. Uh, <laughs> but but here's the other greasy part about it. During this long saga, they actually have contacted lawyers and tried to go the other direction. 
sue other anglers and stuff like that. I'm also hearing because the defamatory. Uh, yeah, defamation of character. Um, is it Did like a see situation that- where you tell the lie and you're just like, I, I told the lie so many times, I believe it. I just. <laughs> That that is I, I think that's part of keeping a straight face, I would think. Did you see the video? Uh, it was like a GoPro or a phone video or something of them in the boat. They were trolling and Jake Runyon had his hood up and and he said, we're just you know, we got I got a good feeling we're going to do well here because, hey, man, we're just doing what we do. Winners win. Yeah, and that's like, what we do. What, Winners win. What a <laughs> slap in the face to the to the entire fishing community what a what a black eye but like we talked about earlier how bad of a scene would that have been had violence erupted in the crowd and they got physical with those two guys and you know wrecked their truck or boat and harm them physically then all of a sudden those guys have you know legitimate charges against the other people that physically hurt them or touched them with assault charges, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many things that could have gone wrong. And I think, I think the tournament director handled that properly and perhaps even with some, you know, informative help from that U S marshal that was participating in the event. So, yeah, I I hope they, I hope they get strapped up for that, man. I hope they get whatever legally can happen to them. I hope happens. And I hope that's just an example set for, you know, for the future of the sport, because that doesn't really, I mean, it it doesn't really have anything to do with bass fishing, but it's tournament fishing at a professional level at a high level of professional fishing. And so there is spillover in, you know, in the integrity of the entire, uh, you know, concept of, of tournament, tournament fishing, man. As soon as I saw the video, that's first thing I thought of. It pissed me off. Not that they, same initially i mean just like anybody else you know you think of how things affect you and different things in but right away i'm like this is w- horrible because this is what this is what casual people think happens you know what i mean like right. th- this is like the all oh, i'm sure you put some weights in those fish or whatever and you like even i remember um barstool tweeted it and i and i went through the comments just to kind of see because barstool's following is so diverse it's from a bunch of different sports it's very very small percentage of it is actual people who follow competitive fishing um started reading it and people were just adamant like making jokes of oh what are they going to get charged what are they going to go to jail you know what i mean like all these different and you're just like yes that's exactly what i mean we're talking about three hundred thousand dollars that they took and boats and they boats, have a hundred thousand like, dollar walleye boat that they won. The boat they were in was from the tournament from a tournament that they won. I mean, and think about just, the dude who's or t- I shouldn't say dude the the team, <laughs> male or female, um, that they got second in that tournament. That has wow. that has now they've accepted. Hey, I got second, but now all of a sudden they're like, "Are you, wait a second? That's my boat. That's, That's our my money. boat." It, it's not a small amount of money. That's a life changing amount of money for some people plus sponsorship opportunities, you know, coverage. I mean, you know, there's a lot of controversy out there about, you know, professional tournament angling anyway. And, you know, but it is what it is. It's a, it's a business. It's a job to, to a lot, to a lot of anglers. It's their primary source of income. It's what feeds their family. It's just like any other sport, football, baseball, hockey, whatever. And, you know, that, I mean, it just goes, it, it's, it's an infinite abyss, an infinitely deep abyss of how deeply this affects the fishing community in so many different ways. And to be honest with you, I think kill tournaments, even if a system is over overpopulated, I think kill tournaments is probably not the way to go because, A, it opens up opportunities for dishonesty and 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 you know uh cheating like what happened but also you know in the public eye they do donate their fish to chair local charities or food banks but at the end of the day in the public eye when you're videotaping a weigh-in you know dead fish aren't really that popular (laughs) 
You know, I mean, there's, there's someone always has something to say about that. And I just think it's bad press. Yeah. But I also think you can't, <laughs> one of the worst things going to come from this is people are going to start like blaming other reasons. Like they were able to do it because of this, they were able to listen. Those guys that were yelling those horrible things behind them. I've been to that part of the world. There's some of the hardest working, good people there is out there. And that's why they were yelling those things. That's why they were so angry. So don't, I don't want anyone to get confused and start blaming. I agree. The more catch release we have, the better, but, but because these scumbags got away with something for a while, don't blame the don't blame the system because they they, it, they were going to beat whatever system there is. If you have balls big enough to, to shove eight enough. pounds of weight inside a walleye, inside of your four or five walleye, whatever the limit was, at an event that you didn't even need to do it. I mean, what Lord knows what they they are capable of, but I, I just think it it's it's a horrible horrible thing for the sport. Um, I think it's something we're going to hear about for years. Like, I literally think that this oh, is yeah. this a Christmas legendary party bust. this year. You're every one of you is going to be there. And, uh, you know, hey, they're so and so that they fish tournaments or they're fans of this sport. And you're going to somebody's going to be like, oh, is that the tournament where they, they shove lead weights in them? No, it's not. I mean, this goes this goes down there with Phil Necro using an Amory board, getting caught on the field. This goes down with steroid use. You know, in in baseball with with the whole home run controversy, this is this is, I mean, one of the biggest news events in the history of professional fishing tournaments. There is no doubt. Do you know, did you hear what the biggest weight, the biggest egg weight they put in one of those fish was? No. I thought they were like three and four ounce weights. Yeah. It was 12 egg ounces, weight. a 12 ounce lead egg sinker was was found i mean and then when he was throwing those weights in the basket i'm like they're all the same there's some a, a little bit smaller than the others but if you think about it if they had let's say they had 20 pounds of fish all five all four of their fish were five pounders let's just say this let's assume that for hypothetical conversation here how and, and eight pounds, eight pounds of weights, that means in four fish, they put two pounds of extra weight in every fish, right? On average. Yeah, a little under two pounds, but yeah, close to, or well, I guess if it's four fish, I thought it was five fish. So yeah, you're right. Two pounds of fish. Two pounds per fish. That's like, how do you do that? I would like to get, I would like a video explanation from the anglers on how they did it. <laughs> Uh, what what blows me away is that you've like if you do this i mean dude people will rob a 7-eleven for 500 dollars. so to think that people won't cheat and won't do things for the kind of money that's out there is just naive realistically people are in bad situations and they will do stupid things um but what blows me away is how do you can like people have thought you were doing this for over a year or what however long this history is and you still had the balls to keep doing it like you would think at some point you'd be like they're on to us let's slide on out of here you know let's quit fishing tournaments let's say hey you guys have made tournaments unenjoyable for us we're out we're retiring but we're retiring like a on top you know or something I, I i think it was like you did you just say sickness yeah it, it like, is it, that's it I think that's a sickness. They got away with it so many times and they won so much. That's where we have to assume this has been going on for a long time because they got addicted to the money and the fan, the, the, the attention, the sponsorship. I mean, you know who I felt sorry for in one of those, in one of those videos was Ranger boats because oh, yeah. Ranger was pasted on that, on that guy's Jersey on the back and the front. And you're just sitting there going, God, how does Ranger feel right now? You know, how much have they paid them to be their, their, primary sponsor jersey sponsor and i'm sure they were in a they were in a i'm sure they were in a ranger boat i was watching the video of them driving away and you, all you could see was the back of the boat but it, i'm pretty sure that was a big ranger walleye boat and 
totally totally loaded down with all the electronics yeah a big kicker motor you know a 300 horsepower engine outboard and god knows what else was on there from sponsors from all i mean it's just it's just it's just disgusting man i can't the, the mfers that were coming across the audio from the crowd was pretty much like all you could say were three words and that was those mfers <laughs> <laughs> that's all you that's all i could think about too man i said i said mf like i don't even know how many times in my head i've watched that video so many times or the three i've seen three different versions from three different camera angles phones from people that ha you know that were filming it and it's like every single time it was just those mfers those mfers <laughs> it's it's a horrible thing um but again, I also like, I agree with you. Yeah, it sucks for Ranger, but it doesn't affect Ranger anyway. You know what I mean? I think that what they've done is despicable enough. I mean, I don't think that people stopped buying Broncos <laughs> back no. in the day. Um, <laughs> white, white Broncos. <laughs> no, I agree with that. I, I do agree with that for sure. And, and they can't be expected to like people to be like, well, they better know who they're doing. No, that guy could have got the shirt through a dealer. He might, that shirt might've come with the boat. They won who even knows? Like there's so many. And as a, I mean, the tournament director that deals with them all the time and had heard of them, they haven't caught them up till now. Uh, you know, this wasn't their first time. So what they've done has been incredibly complex complex and dude when you see videos like the one you brought up where they're saying hey winners win like i see a video like that and all of a sudden pre like let's say I, this, this weight video never happens nobody checks them but if you see those you start putting it together you're like well no man if, if he was if they were cheating he wouldn't be that arrogant but i evidently you would be because they, they were <laughs> I'm going to take the words out of Jason Christie's mouth. That made me want to punch someone in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's horrible, horrible. Um, I think it's horrible for the sport, really. And I, I think that that gets used too much. I think when people see things, they're like, well, this is a black mark for the sport. This is, this is, but this is also something totally different. You know, it's not, it's, it's not. Uh, how much do you think that this has ever happened on the elite series on the elite series? No, I don't think this has ever happened on the elite series. Has cheating ever happened ever? I'm going to, you know, in the history of it, probably. Well, yeah, because you know, people have been disqualified. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, not probably for sure. There's been cheating. Sure. But most but, of it's been cheating like getting a ticket for not slowing down and not completely stopping at a stop sign that does not make you the same as the dude driving 180 miles an hour um uh, maybe it does to some people but you know what i mean like they're all in, in most of the things i know it was like hey you forgot to put your life jacket on when we were close to a dam or you forgot to slow down yeah. in a slow zone um those are violations of mm -hmm. rules not necessarily cheating you know there's i mean you can forget in the heat of the moment and you're in a hurry to pack up and get to your you got 15 minutes left you got a 12 minute boat ride you're you know you're you're six ounces from where you want to be. I mean, a lot of things can happen in a short amount of time and forget being forgetful about, you know, whatever it is, kill switches or life jackets or, or whatever that is. That's one thing, but you know what those guys did or, or to suggest, I think the system, and again, I'm not, I'm not like, I, I totally agree with you. You can't blame the system for what those guys did. You have to blame their character. I mean, so I, I answered a question a couple of times on DMs yesterday on Instagram about, you know, what, what kind of people are these? And I go, well, these are the, th these two guys, one of them's probably the leader and one of them is probably the follower, right? One of them suggested it first. The other one said, which one, the guy who ran or the guy who stayed? Which one do you think? I it's think the guy that stayed, just the look on his face and what he said in that in that video, winners w just win. That <laughs> to me is just so arrogant and so so convincing. Like he practiced that in the mirror with a, to say it with a straight face, knowing he's cheating the way he is and he's stealing all this money. 
but I think that, you know, I, I think um, the the system at, at the Bass Elite level or all the Bass Master events, high school, I've covered high school, college, opens, brackets, elites, pretty much every level, not Bass Nation, but, you know, pretty much every level of Bass Master events. And, you know, they have to come in, they dump those fish. First of all, they have to be alive. You know, there's, yep. there's a, there's a penalty and I want everyone to know that watches this, that I've been in a ton of boats. We've been around all these anglers. There is a, a, a massive amount of integrity on the Bassmaster Elite series, all the anglers, whether it's whatever it is, if it's contagious integrity, whatever it is, there's a ton of integrity and the system, the system forces it too because they have to a keep their fish alive and i've heard it so many times from a lot of different anglers they're not just concerned about the four ounces of uh, four p penalty ounces that they get on a dead fish it bothers them when a big fish is on the verge of dying in their live well and they stop what they're doing knowing that they're losing fishing time in the water bait time in the water to take care of one fish in their live well when they could legally if it's still if it's still pumping its gills they can cull that fish they can throw that fish in the water and cull it no matter how big it is legally right that's what the rules say yeah but they don't they go out of their way they use G juice or Mountain Dew, or they fizz the fish. They put ice, you know, pounds and pounds of extra ice in their boat. They put it in the live well to go out of their way to make sure the fish that they put in their live well have every opportunity to survive, whether it's the boat ride back, a hook in the gill, whatever it is, they do their best to make. This isn't just about the rules. It's about caring about the resource too. I feel it when, when these guys are doing it. And so, you know, I think, I think the public needs to know that about the bass, um, you know, elite series or the bass master series uh, overall from top to bottom. And this started a long time ago. This was something that Ray Scott had figured out way back when in the early days. And he hired someone like Gene Gilliland to come in and figure out, you know, what's best in the concert in the name of conservation of the resource. How do we take care of these fish so that we can continue to have live, you know, fish weigh-ins on stage so that the crowd gets to see what, you know, what these guys are bringing in and it's part of the excitement. So he went way out of his way, spent who knows how much money trying to figure all this out with all the live tank, the pontoon live tanks they have and the treatments they put in the water, hiring a scientist like Gene Gilland to take care of these, to figure all this out. And it works, it works. And so someone suggested to me yesterday on Facebook in a, in a very long and, and in depth post about the walleye guys suggested to me that walleyes are much weaker and they're more susceptible to live well um, injury and, and shock than, than bass are. And, and I beg to differ. I actually fished the professional walleye trail for five years as a, as an amateur. And I fished a lot of, of events, <laughs> a lot of <laughs> events with a lot of pros and those were live weigh-ins as well. And there were, they had a very good system. You know, it was obviously in fishermen and the background of in fishermen that, that, you know, sanctioned those events were very knowledgeable people that go back into the right, maybe even beyond, but back well back into the black and white days of television and, and, and historical, uh, you know, professional tournament development. And they, they went out of their way to take care of those walleyes too. And very seldom did you have dead walleyes in those tournaments. I hosted a fall walleye tournament um, on Lake McConaughey for nine years, nine straight seasons, every late September, early October, I hosted a, a fall walleye tournament on Lake McConaughey. And I used lots of tactics. We taught anglers how to fizz their fish because in the fall, obviously a lot of people know that those walleyes go deep and they'll spoon those fish up out of 30 to 80 feet of water. And so their air bladders, their air bladders fill up, they get to the surface, they can't, they can't deflate. 
fizzing works when done properly. And so, you know, something that I had learned a long time ago on the PWT trail was how to fit, how to fizz a walleye. And we taught anglers at Lake McConaughey how to do that. And it worked. So anyway, a long to make a long story longer, you know, I didn't buy into the fact that walleyes are more susceptible to live well damage or, or, or shock or whatever it is that would kill them in live wells. Because if you go out of your way and you take care of them, like these bass anglers do, I think you're good to go. So you're saying you don't think anyone cheats on the elite series. I, I don't, I, that's I how don't that question know. started. I don't, I don't, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I just, I, I just one, one thought led to another, man. I, I, you know, I would hate to think anyone on the elite series cheats. I'm sure it crosses people's minds when they're close to something. I mean, human nature, what is the old saying? My buddy, Jay Gregory from the wild outdoors once said, uh, the three things that will make a man make the worst decisions of his life are money, sex, and big bucks. And you can, you can replace big bucks with big fish lots of ducks, geek, whatever it is you're after greed makes people make really bad decisions. So I don't know. I just know that there's a lot of integrity and the system is very tight at the elite level. So I, I don't even like to think about that, to be honest it, with you. I, I think by the time people, and it's not just the elite series, top level tournaments, by the time people get there, the cheaters have been sussed out for the most part. Uh, now, and obviously we've seen things where people have taken liberties and stuff. And recently we saw an angler at MLF get DQ'd from an event because of, of some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's so rare. I just think it's, it's by the time you get to the top level, uh, you know, it, it's, you've been caught or eliminated at some point. So, so let me ask you this, because one of the things that they do in Japan that that I've seen in the past, and I've watched anglers kind of laugh off. about it. No, well, yeah, that too, I guess. <laughs> uh, they'll wand the fish like they literally, you know, like when you enter a club, the wand that they run down your legs and or the airport wherever they wand the bags as they come through. Do you think that's something? Do you, like do you think this will change tournaments and maybe the procedures that people have to do? I think some tournaments it will. I yeah. don't think, I don't think that's something, I think that is something that is, that diminishes the presentation of the weigh-ins at the elite level. I, I think, I th I don't think that's necessary. And I think, I think, I think forcing that to happen is, is bruising the integrity of the brand, in my opinion, because the people, I mean, it, eventually it comes out in the wash, right? I mean, these guys got caught. How long have they been doing it now? Maybe there are, I've been asked, I've been asked by the tournament director and I'm not going to name names. There's no way I would do that, but I have been asked by the tournament director at elite events. Did something, did this happen or did that happen? And, and I absolutely, uh, I, it's only been one, one time, but when I was asked that question, I said, absolutely not. And it was, you know, a question about a technique. And, and I just said, no, these, no, none of these fish were snagged. These fish were caught in the mouth, every single one of them, even the ones that you didn't see live. I watched or, or recorded it. You can go back and watch every single one of them. This was a completely honest bag of fish that this guy caught. I agree. And I also think that there's a lot more eyeballs when you get to, I mean, people way underestimate the power of a camera lens and not just the one on the back deck of your boat. If you're competing on the elite series, even if you're not in competition, even if it's the day one of this, of the event, we don't know what place you're in or anything. There's boats all over the place taking pictures. And I mean, their biggest problem is finding somewhere to go to the bathroom. It, right, really, exactly. to be honest, as opposed exactly. to you can't, you, you can't get away with it, but, um, they uh, probably do need to, you know, figure out how to make sure everyone's GoPros. I mean, everyone is supposed to have a GoPro or a tacky yeah. cam or something in their boat if they don't have a marshal or if they do have a marshal. And not every not every angler has a marshal at every event because there's not always enough marshals to go around. And so 
but you know, and I've actually thought about that for many years in my, in my position as a cameraman on the elite series, when some, when you see someone like Rick Clun go out without a marshal, you're just like, there's no pro like that. This is, this is, you don't even question that, you know, this is, the, and, and, and I like to think that about everyone, but, but you also think about particularly, you know, young guys, huh? So what do they do? What do they do when someone doesn't have a marshal? Well, they've got a GoPro or a tactic cam and those cameras are supposed to be running all the time. Yeah. That's why most of them either have solar energy powering their GoPros or they have some sort of, you know, lithium battery tucked in their one of their back lockers um, to run their camera all day long. There are flaws in, you know, in the in the setup in the rigs that they have, because GoPros aren't always that, you know, totally reliable. But, you know, maybe they, maybe they, maybe they figure something out. I mean, I, I've just bought a new truck or I'm in the process of buying a new truck and there's actually a plug-in on the back of this new 2022 model that I'm buying that has a plug-in for an accessory camera for my boat trailer or whatever cargo trailer. So if you want to put a, 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 like a car cam on your boat, while you're running down the highway, you can plug it into the accessory outlet on the back of your truck so that you can see what's going on under your boat or in the boat or under the under the cover of your boat or whatever it is while you're running. So, you know, technology will probably fix itself in this case at some point. Yeah. And I think with with the you mentioned one big difference, you know, with Fish having to be alive, it changes a lot of things. There's not, you can't shove 12 ounces of weight inside a fish and expect it to live uh, or human, really, I would imagine. Um, you can't do that and expect to live. Um, so it, it handles itself a little bit there. But I also don't think the wanding the bags is a big deal, like the way they do it in Japan. Like as you come through, they just wand your fish. But I just think it's ridiculous that. It just sucks because it's it's the thing that it's like TV shows, fishing shows forever. Everybody thinks there's a scuba diver down there. <laughs> and I right, wish we had yeah. the kind of budget to have <laughs> such things, uh, but we don't. But it's like the old like that's what you hear. You go to a Christmas party and you meet Joe, the accountant. Joe, the accountant, that's the questions they ask. Oh, yeah. Don't you guys have scuba divers? Oh, don't they just put weights in those fish? So. The fact that somebody actually did it and um, it sucks. It's it's a bad mark on the sport. Um, oh, it, it's been in the deer hunting community for years. A guy, you know, becomes really good at understanding the biology and the habits of of mature whitetail bucks. He goes in and and harvests a really big one. The next year he goes and harvests another big one and over a 20 or 10 year, 20 year career, you know, he kills a bunch of really big trophy whitetails because he's figured it out. Well, the word around town is, you know, he's baiting. There's no way he can be that good at it. And, th and then all of a sudden, you know, that guy's got the integrity and the knowledge and the time to put in to understand it that well. But then, then there's some other guy in, in a state, you know, in some other state that's been doing it for 10 years and he gets busted for, for pouring corn out for, and baiting deer in. And then all of a sudden it, it creates question amongst everyone that, that, that does that. So, you know, man, stop. If you're a cheater, stop, <laughs> you know, just stop, man. This is just, this is, there's no place for that in, in the sport and these activities. It's just, it's just, it's just BS, man. Yeah. Well, it, it also makes me think of something I saw once, and I've thought about this the rest of my life. I was in a car. I was in a store, Dollar General type store. And this was years ago, and this kid tried to steal like a little dinky car. You know what I mean? Like, anyways, he gets caught. He's a young kid, and he's in a thing, and the mother's mortified, obviously, like everybody would be. And the mother instantly started defending the kid. You know, it's just a little car. He's just a little kid. He's just, that's why it's so important not to treat that kid. Okay. After he does that, because that nobody starts stealing 
Bentleys, but they hey, get there. It starts with right. a dinky car. It starts that with the marbles. Wheels, it starts that little with little hard something. wheels turns into a Mustang GT 20 years from then. Yeah. Some point. I, I agree, Dave. I, I totally agree. When I was about five years old, I came out. I'll never forget this. I came out of a little grocery store in our little town of Camden, Tennessee, and I put I stole a Three Musketeers bar, put it in my pocket, and walked out. We got to my mom's car. I think it was like a Ford Impala or something. It was like it was back Chevy in the Impala. 70s. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Chevy. Yeah, Chevy we had Impala. one of those when we first moved to Canada. <laughs> and so I get in the car and I open this. I open this candy bar and I start eating it. And my mom turns around and she goes, where did you get that? And I said, from the store. And she goes, she was, she got pissed, like, yeah. like pissed. She got out of the car, opened the back door, grabbed me by the arm, pulled me out of the car and said, you go in there right now. You take this to the store manager and you apologize for what you did right now. And I was in tears. I was scared. I was hurt. I was embarrassed. I was all the above, all those things that you're supposed to feel when you get caught doing something like that. I walked into Beasley's grocery store, you know, but that was back when the manager of the store was sitting in an elevated office <laughs> above the store so he could watch everything. And I, I walked in there and my mom goes, Mr. Beasley, my son has something to tell you. And he came out of the swinging door and walked down the stairs and he knew what was going on. Cause I had this three musketeers open yeah, with a bite bar. Mark. It's all over your face. <laughs> <laughs> just, exactly. that, that made you so happy only moments before, but now it's yeah. just shame. <laughs> oh, it's shame, man. It might as well have been a turd in my hand. Man. <laughs> and so he walks down and he, he bends over and gets eye to eye with me. And it took me like, I felt like, like everything went numb and I, everything went totally silent and it was just me and him in the spotlight and everything else around us was just frozen in time. And I said, Mr. Beasley, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to steal this. I just wanted it. My mom knew my mom wouldn't buy it for me. And so he took it back and he, you know, he patted me on the back and he goes, please don't ever do that again. But I really appreciate you coming in here and telling me the truth. And I never stole, I never stolen anything since that day. And that was the lesson in life. So take it back to what you just said and how parents need to parent. Maybe it only takes one correction like that to, to dissolve the greediness in a young person for the rest of their lives, because they learned one lesson when they were five or six years old. And that taught them not to ever do that again. So do you back to our walleye friends? Do you think they were driven by money, or do you think they were driven by glory of of yes, all being the above. those guys, all the above? That's ego. Again, you know, that's someone asked me. I don't think I addressed this earlier. Someone asked me, you know, what are these people like? These kinds of people are the guys that would would attempt to screw your wife would if they watched you drop your wallet they would take the money out of your wallet you know these are the yeah, kinds they think of that's guys. okay they think yeah. i gave him his wallet back i took all the cash out of it whatever he'll never know yeah yeah Th that's the kind of people they are they don't care they don't they have no conscious they don't care what other people think they don't ha care how it makes other people feel and and you know it, that kind of character goes i guarantee you can't i can't bet on it because i don't know them but i can almost guarantee you that if you go back in their life history if you had you ever see that movie the final cut with robin williams in it i think i'm gonna say yes it, it's it's a non-comedy it was one of the most one of the most serious movies i think he's ever played was it when he was a photographer he worked in a photography place well, he was the he was a because he was the librarian when they were making putting implants, uh, camera implants in people's in in chips in their eyes, and their entire lives were this. being recorded. Oh, it's called the Final Cut. It's a fairly old movie, but he was the librarian, so you could go into his his office in the library, and he could he could go and 
find your video, your life history video, go back and, and reel back in time and show you what happened in your life. If you ever had any questions on how, why you feel the way you do today, he could rewind back to when, you know, you did something wrong that affected someone person's life and from that point forward subconsciously you became the, a different person for the rest of your life over it and i think that's part of i think that's part of this those those two guys i wouldn't trust those guys with anything i, I wouldn't get i wouldn't say hey man we hang on to my wallet i gotta go over here and you know i gotta go to the bathroom or whatever i would not trust them with anything and I hope this, I hope this cleans it up. You know, we say this is a really bl big black eye on the fishing, sport fishing community or the tournament fishing community. And I agree with that. Perhaps this needed to happen. This went public and now this is going to clean up yeah. some of that stuff and make the integrity stand out that much more because those guys are examples of what can happen, particularly in today's world of social media and iPhone cameras and all that stuff. Yeah. And in, uh, I can't say it enough. I said it's a black eye on, on tournament fishing, but it's a black eye on tournament fishing for those who want it to be. For it'll be something that people you'll have to all will all have to answer for for years to come. It'll it's it's, but I still feel like ninety nine point nine percent of the people in the industry are great. You know what I mean? That that's what makes the fishing industry. That's what makes the outdoor industry so special, because you know there are people I want to hang with. There are people who. <laughs> Uh, we have like-minded feelings and thoughts on a lot of things and, and, and the outdoors just kind of bonds us together. So don't let exactly. two idiots affect what you think about this industry because it hasn't changed. It's, exactly. it's no different than it was before these two idiots got caught. Um, they just happened to be two idiots that did something stupid. Um, you mentioned a movie to, to 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 leave our walleye guys. You mentioned a movie, um, but I watched a movie that made me think of you, non freaking stop, and just the idiot that you might be. Don't tell and, me it was the Karate Kid. <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, I did. I, I, actually, it's funny. My son Lee watched movie. the Karate Kid recently, <laughs> and we were all about it. Um, free Solo. I watched. I'd, I'd heard about it. For so long, and and you know, he I'm a big Rogan fan, clearly, and I've been um meaning to watch it. And it was just one night we were like, well, let's watch this free solo movie. But dude, there was parts of that movie that I literally free solo, for those of you who don't know, it's about a, a climber who climbs without ropes, without anything. Alex Honold, like, yeah. Yeah. And Alex, what? Honold. Honold, yeah. So Alex, um, is nuts what he does and i just kept thinking about you and your ice climbing days Did, have you seen that movie and and oh, as yeah. a climber how nuts is what he does as a clock from a climber standpoint we know and everyone knows he's one microscopic mistake away from death yeah if he makes a mistake he's gonna die and the route that he climbed on the nose on el capitan was it's not easy. I mean, no. the first people that climbed that route, you know, were banging pins into cracks and aid climbing it. They weren't, there was no one crazy enough to free solo that. And Alex has been, you know, there's one, there's an old saying about free soloists and that they all die. They're all, they're all one. They all die. I mean, I've known several of them that were friends of mine that were very famous in the rock and ice climbing world that died so free soloing it is it is an insanely risky and consequential event when you decide to do that however the people that do do that like alex honold he finds freedom and he knows yeah. the consequences that he's facing and then he's putting himself in and he's he's a genius level his, his mind works at a genius level from an engineering a route finding a physics like all these things come into play when you're rock climbing at that level and one of the things that was you know being strewn through the rock climbing community at the professional level like if someone did something you know crazy in the Bassmaster world and all the anglers are talking about what happened from a positivity perspective or a what if what if perspective 
you know, professional climbers that I know from way back when from Canada and, and America alike, we've talked about this before. And, and it's, you know, do you do that for money? Cause they made, they made a lot of money off of that film. I mean, that thing won, that thing won an Oscar best yeah. documentary. I mean, that was, they, they, and they're doing more films. Um, and so the controversy there is, do you put yourself because they're filming this, that you, you put yourself at risk to free solo something for the fame and money, or are you really doing it for yourself and your own mind? And if you are, why film it? Because you risk all the people watching it, the crowd at the at ground level and Yosemite that was watching it with spotting scopes and binoculars. If the guy falls and dies, there's trauma involved there. Of course, you have the choice whether you're going to watch it or not. Or if you're a camera guy like Jimmy Chin or some of those guys that were doing it, you choose to, to film that and you put yourself at risk to see that yourself. If he were to die, do you stop filming it or do you film it all the way to the ground? All these questions came up in, in conversation about that movie. And I'll address it this way. There's a better movie about a different guy that no one's ever heard of called The Alpinist. And I believe it's on like United Airlines on their in their movie selection. It's called The Alpinist. And it is it's to me, I'm not going to say it's I'm not going to say that it's better for everyone, but it's better for me because this is about a guy who has. He, he's either he's autistic or he has a different he has a different level of mentality that he has a disorder but he is unbelievably talented and he's an ice climber and he does all these insane even more insane what alex honnell did on on your on el capitan and yosemite this guy's doing in the canadian rockies in pakistan like he's doing it he wasn't inviting anyone to come film him or watch him he would literally sneak off no one would know where he went and he would go do these insane solos um by himself so if you get a chance if you like free solo go go plug into the the alpinist it's it's a much better in my opinion a much better movie so so do 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 a, are a lot of climbers against kind of free solo climbing like meaning like you, you're making it negative toward like towards the sport or is it i think there are some people i i think I, but i also think or jealousy, is that jealousy yeah, yeah, I think jealousy brings that out in people like they want to criticize someone that made millions of dollars off of a movie like Free Solo because they're jealous because they made a lot of money. So they create controversy, you know, because it's a controversial activity. Like, really, if you think about it, if, if Alex sits down and he's a very honest person and and very you know he wears his his honesty on his sleeve so everyone can see it he's not scared to say what's on his mind to anyone mm -hmm. and so if someone were to ask him which i don't maybe someone has i don't know did you do this for the fame or the money or did you do this for yourself and if he looked into a camera and said well i did this for myself i always free solo for myself then the question becomes why did you accept money for it? And why did you have people film it then? What was your purpose in doing that? And so that becomes the argument or the debate in the community, just like it would if something happened in the bass fishing world. You know, it's just, it, there, there's always haters. There's always jealousy. There's always questionable people. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the only person you really have to answer the question to is yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it um, and I could see how there would be naturally hate. Like, think about it. I mean, as a non-climber myself at all, I mean, the only thing I've ever climbed is a tree and I wasn't great at it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, hey, I climbed Yosemite or whatever this mountain is that you, cl you climb with ropes. You are a badass. But then you, because of this stupid movie, they too have to answer for it for the rest of their life. You meet people at a bar and you'd be like, yeah, I climb Yosemite. <laughs> and then they'd be like, have you ever done it without ropes? It, it must drive a lot of climbers crazy. But I, I thought it was a cool movie. I um 
I think that's a fine line for everything. You know what I mean? Like, well, why, if, you, if it's truly for you, why do you do it? Well, the money that you got from it allows you to be free and, and do what you really wanted. I mean, I felt watching the movie and it's a movie they can show it from whatever. I felt like he was very, I felt like it was something he did for himself and he battled with the, I'm selling out kind of, you know what I mean? Like he want, he worked with the crew and everything, but I mean, who knows whether it's right or wrong. I just thought it was an amazing accomplishment and it made me think of you. So why does a climber go from like climbing rocks to climbing ice? Like you did, is that more challenging or is that just where you live? I think it's ba I think it's in your personality. I have a pretty aggressive approach to my goals and I can, I can honestly say, even as a camera guy, an artist, whatever it is I'm doing, I don't, I don't do things to show off. I don't do things to go make money. I didn't start shooting photos for money. In fact, ironically enough, as we talk about this, the very first photo I ever published in my life and got paid for it was the front cover of the North Face catalog. And at that time in 1999 or 1998, when I snapped the photo and the North Face bought that from me, the guys that made the film Free Solo, Jimmy Chin and his cohorts were first coming on to the North Face scene as well. Like we came into it at the same time. I didn't follow up. I had no professional experience, didn't know. I, I felt like I just got lucky. And, and snapped a photo that they really liked and I got paid for it. But as progression would have it, I was at least smart enough to take that money and upgrade my camera, upgrade my lens. And I started shooting more and one thing led to another. So then it became a business, right? And perhaps Alex, I, I can almost guarantee you this from a climber's perspective, every single solo he's ever done, including that one on the nose at El Capitan, he did do for himself because he had to be so focused on what he was doing. He had, he can't look too far ahead and he can't look below. He has to be focused on where he is because every move is different dynamically. So he has to be completely ultra focused on what he's doing, or he's going to lose his life. And he knows that his friends are watching him not to put them in that position. So again, having said that, they set it up, but when he woke up that morning, at whatever it was, one thirty or two o'clock in the morning, they didn't. He didn't make an announcement. And go, hey, everybody, no. I'm going to go do it now. He went and did it in his own head because he felt like his headspace was it was was in the right space, and he had the he had the mental fortitude and opportunity and capacity to go to go accomplish what he did that day, and he did. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think it builds from a personal perspective up to and personally i'm glad they made a lot of money off of that i'm glad those guys have worked their asses off for a very long time in some really really harsh conditions to get to where they are and they didn't do jimmy chin will tell you the story that when he was he was going he was actually going to i think he was going to gasherbrum in nepal to climb an eight thousand meter peak or maybe even an Antarctica trip. And he was one of the climbers, one of the talents in the, in this photography assignment that national geographic was doing. I think it might've been Antarctica, but the, one of the, the photographer who was supposed to be assigned to that trip got injured before they left. So the publisher and director of the trip gave Jimmy Chin the camera who had never been a photographer in his life and said, here, you're now the new photographer for this assignment because we can't bail on it. And he, it, he'll explain to you, he didn't even know how to turn the camera on. And from that point forward, he was very successful in that trip just because he had the raw talent. Plus the backdrop is amazing. And one of the key things about, you know, becoming a famous photographer or really good at it or professional, whatever, is putting yourself in position to get photos that other people can't. So obviously they were in that environment and he did. And from that point forward, he worked his ass off for, for two or three decades to get to where he is now. And I say good for him. Good for all of them. 
Yeah, good for all of them. I, I found it amazing. I mean, no shortcuts in that sport. There definitely isn't. You can't. There's no cheating. Lead, There's no lead lead weights, weights into in the, that shit. <laughs> no, that. Um, I. It's just. It was a bit like. They literally, there was times I had to look away. Like I'm like, oh my, I can't even look like at what he's doing, and he's hanging off this, this mountain. Um, but I want to get into, and I don't even know if you how much of this you're able to talk about. Um, but it's kind of fitting for this week. Because when you guys are watching this, it's Wednesday. We're actually recording this on Monday. Tomorrow, I'll be heading to Montgomery, Alabama for a celebration of life for the one and only Mr. Ray Scott. And then uh, Thursday, I'll be in Springfield, Missouri for the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame, and um, uh, which is always an amazing event. You get to see the who's who of the industry and, and the amazing inductees every single year. But you kind of got to hang around with all of that wrapped up in a bow in the last few weeks with a project you're working on. Can you talk about that at all? I don't know. I mean, no one <laughs> Best seems way to, to find out. <laughs> yeah, no one really seems to care. Let, let's say this, okay? We're I'm on assignment and I'm very, very lucky to be a part of this, okay? Because I haven't been around this sport at this level for very long, 11 years in a cameraman's career is i guess quite a long time for some people but relative to when this all started when when the um uh, bass started it's a very it's a drop in the bucket particularly when you when you measure it up to how many things have happened how much has changed how far it's come from 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 day one but to answer your question we are you know i'm on assignment with ben oliver and we're shooting a, 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 a documentary about the history of, of bass. And, and it is quite intriguing. Everyone is going to need to watch this when it comes out. I, as I understand it, it may start coming out sometime in early 2023. We have most of this first year's um, episodes shot. We still have a couple more to do. But it starts from day one, from from the day Ray Scott. Oh man, I get chills, and I'm I'm telling you, Dave. I was sitting in 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 Bill Dance's office. We had the whole thing studio lit, and Bill Dance, being from Tennessee, a Tennessee football fan, yeah. the, the orange tea. I wish I had it. It's upstairs, but I got him. He gave me, he gave me a Tennessee hat and he told me stories about things that happened, like how the 20, the 24 volt trolling motor system started at Beaver Dam Resort in Camden, Tennessee on Kentucky Lake, my hometown in like 1969 and his trolling motor broke. He's telling me this story and, and his trolling motor broke in a tournament in a bass tournament on Kentucky Lake. And he contacted his wife and had her, all she had at home for a spare trolling motor was this 24 volt trolling motor, which was a prototype. And she got on a Greyhound because he needed it the next day. She got on a Greyhound with that trolling motor, brought it on a, on a Greyhound on, on board. It was too big to fit under the compartment. So she brought it on board and, and, and tried to put it up above her head. It wouldn't fit. So she <laughs> held on to this trolling motor unpackaged. Will you brought it to him in, 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 in beaver dam resort or somewhere in camden tennessee and he put it on his boat and they had to go buy a new battery because it wouldn't run on one 12 volt battery so he mounted two 12 volt batteries and everyone figured out how long he could how much longer he could run that trolling motor in that tournament hence the 24 volt and 36 volt battery systems for trolling motors were born i mean these are these are things that everyone who's a bath and bass enthusiast needs to to know and and see because they're going to understand the sport they're going to understand the integrity which goes back to why this we started this podcast in the first place of these two idiots cheating in this walleye tournament ray scott's integrity 
began from day one. I mean, I've heard, you know, he struggled and he wasn't oh, always man. on mark with everything that he said or promises that he kept, but he struggled to get to where he wanted this to be because his vision was where we are today. He knew this was going to happen if he did this the right way. And part of that or all of that was hiring the right people like Helen Severe, Bob Cobb, and, and having people like Roland Martin, Bill Dance, Hank Parker involved in his events to bring integrity to this to his to his vision. And, and that's where we are today. That's why when we talk about do you think there's cheating going on in the Bassmaster Elite Series, there's too much integrity there. And those guys are going to get weeded out fast because that contagiousness has been handed up or handed down, however you want to look at it, through the anglers and everyone involved in Bassmaster from Ray Scott's vision back in back in the day, back when it first started, it's, it's an unbelievable assignment. And it, it's, and it's so much more than just tournaments. I mean, it's it, like Ray Scott, you know, I kept thinking about it when you were talking earlier about catch and release and stuff, there was a time when Ray Scott said, we're going to release all of these fish and nobody released bass. Like literally nobody. He took it from trout fishing because trout fishing, they had got exactly. onto it earlier that like how precious that resource is and it's so limited and they started catch and release and he took it from there. But there was a time when I think it was in Mississippi or wherever the tournament was where they literally had to stand up on this dam and they said, we're releasing these fish. And the law was like, you're not releasing these fish. And they had a standoff and it was like, well, you're going to have to stop me if you want to. So the, the things that, that Ray Scott and Bob Cobb and, and, and I hate even naming names because there's so many people that have touched and molded and made this sport that we both love what it is. And, um, that project that, that you, Ben, JM and Bass is working on is, is honestly something that's needed to happen for a long time. And it's something I'm, I'm really excited to see. And I'm kind of a little jealous. Like, I mean, uh, you know, getting texts from you at dinners with Bob Cobb and stuff like that. It makes me feel left out. I wish it was there because I know those are always a lot of fun. But um, it's an amazing, your name, amazing your name comes up all like at every sit down. Your name comes up, Dave. So you are deaf. You have definitely been there in spirit. And and uh, we we talk about you. And there is definitely love in the air for Dave Mercer at all these interviews, man. I can well. promise you that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know if love is the word I would use, but I appreciate them. Well, the them. boots, the boots, the boots are, are big boots to fill from, from when everyone involved riders now that, that took the, took the, uh, opportunities that were given to them that Bob Cobb get, you know, handed to them or the people in the marketing department that Helen Severe hired to create what we have today and, and, and the people that Ray Scott got involved to make this happen. It goes back to the old cliche. You're only as good as the people you associate yourself with. And that's what he did. That's what left. That's, that was, that's his, it, it makes me get goosebumps and it almost brings me to tears. I get choked up when I think about it because of the legacy that he left behind and and it, it's all summed up in one word in my opinion and, and this is just going i wasn't there you know i wasn't there for the first classic i've i've seen the video numerous times and i've, I've interviewed people now and i understand it much better than i ha ever have before but the one word that i would use to to wrap up that entire project is integrity and the contagiousness of the integrity and that this was not going to be wavered. Integrity is not going to be wavered. If you're, I guarantee you, there are certain things that have happened um, in, in Bassmaster events that Ray Scott probably would have just gotten rid of anglers for and said, you're, you you don't belong in this group of people because that what you did does not illustrate what I started. Okay. And we're not going to waver. We're going to make you an example of this because 
you need to understand this is the direction this is going to go. These are the tracks that we set this train on and you're not going to knock it off of those tracks. Yeah. I mean, and some of them sound bizarre. Like when you hear some of them, like you hear anglers talk, like, like at the classic when bass gets the anglers rooms, covers the anglers rooms. If you weren't married, you were not staying with somebody. Like there was all these different things. You're like, how can a tournament? But if you think at the time, like what Ray was trying to create, he's built, he was literally building a sport. Um, we're talking about all the media that, that, that our sport has gotten because of a negative, but Ray was literally hounding down newspaper writers, everybody to cover this sport. And he didn't want any negative to be around it at all um, while he was building it. And it, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's a true, he is, you know, your great American dreamer, visionary, um, whatever you want to call it. He's the kid that people point fingers at when you're young and say stuff because his dreams were so big that People with simpler minds have to laugh because they just can't imagine that. Okay. So you're going to build tournament fishing into this huge. Yes, he did. And, and it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, there's no shortcuts in, in life. And that's honestly, I guess that's what this podcast comes down to. There is literally no shortcuts because two guys tried to take a giant shortcut and, um, it's over for them. I mean, there'll be no more tournament fishing. I mean, it'll be hard pressed for them to fish or who knows if they even like fish, you know, maybe this was just a an elaborate scam, but there's uh, no shortcuts in life. This reminds me you're talking about Ray Scott and the way he pioneered, you know, tournament bass fishing. It's like what Bugsy Siegel did. For Las Vegas. <laughs> when he, I'm telling you, it's a no great analogy. Hey, Ray man, Scott and when Bugsy. he built, Hey, when he went out to the desert and built the first uh, uh, casino called the Flamingo, no one showed up. But he truly believed that if you build it, people will come. And no one believed he had this vision of what Las Vegas would be, just like Ray Scott had the vision of what Bass, Bass Master or Bass would be eventually. When I held the first, the very first cover or the very first printed magazine, um uh that that bass did that bob cobb edited and wrote and hired writers to write articles for photographers and all that stuff i'm sitting there looking at this first issue going don't you i mean you know the the front covers of largemouth bass in a in a in a green green water underwater scene and you're just i'm just like you know, this isn't a, a great photo, but at that time, they're probably standing there going, this is an unbelievable photo. We actually captured a largemouth bass underwater, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they put it on the cover and to, to feel that history vibe go through your body. It makes me want to protect bass, B-A-S-S and Bassmaster. It makes me as a fan, as an employee, as, as part of the whole scene, it makes me want to defend it and protect it that much more because of what Ray Scott did for it. it it's, it's unbelievable. It's cool. Yeah. I, he's the chicken that laid the egg. I, I <laughs> say that to, to Ray. I used to say that to Ray and I always say that to Bob and it, it's amazing what they've, I mean, there was a time when a bass was just another fish. It literally was just another fish. Like there On was trout, stringer. there was bass, there was, but it was just another fish. It was just a, you go fish like, and now bass fishing go into any North American tackle store. It is literally 70 to 80% of their sales, a good, you, you know, it depend Looking on the area, you know, further shots. north you get like it, it's dude, it's dude, this is all part of it. You know, I mean, think about the boat manufacturing, you know, the freaking, I mean, bass, Johnny Morris, bass pro shops, you know, everything, everything that, that, the, 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 what he did, what Bass did, what Ray Scott did for so many people, it's endless. It is completely impossible to cover every detail about what, you know, mushroomed out of that concept. Everything, this podcast, <laughs> the hat that you're wearing, you know, 
the logo on your shirt, you know, my, my hoodie, my, my hat. freaking job, your job. You know what I mean? Uh, like the, the he, scars on my hands from the <laughs> sharp hooks that have been, you know, everything, everything, dude. It's incredible. It's incredible. No shortcuts in life. But I do have an I do have one story because it it flashed up on my Twitter here, and I've heard a lot about it this week, and it's I think it's a good one. And this is not it's not a knock on you, Jake, but <laughs> bring it. You're boy. you're gonna you're gonna think it is. It's not. Okay. Um, I can take it. So I said there's no shortcuts in life, but there is in Las Vegas. It turns out there's big news is coming out. I don't know if you've heard about this. You can now get a leg lengthening surgery. So people that have, <laughs> people that were shorter and want to get taller, they can add between three and six inches um, to your legs. And it is like, the, the, but listen to this most messed up surgery. They break your femur. What are your two? Your, the big one is your femur, right? Tibia. Your tibia. femur is in your thigh. Yeah, your the tibia femur. and your, uh, your, your tibia is your shin, right? Yes. Okay. So they break or, the, no, your tibula and fibula, or is that your other? They're similar to the arm bones, but your femurs up up from your hips to your knees, and then going down from your knees to your ankles are your your tib and fib. Okay, well let's go with your thigh. The big okay, your femur, your femur. They break if you want if you want only three inches, they'll break that, basically break that, and they put this device in this. Listen to this. If you want six inches, they got to break both. They got to break your thigh and your shin, basically. And then you get this device put in you, and it gives waves, basically electronic waves, which slowly stretch, slowly stretch the, the bones and lengthen it. So you can add, and it takes six months. So you spend six months in bed to recover for like, to, and, and and every day they're getting a little bit longer and you, and you got to take a lot of pain pills. It says, <laughs> so you're going to end up a little taller, but after six months, you're probably going to have a chronic dependency on opioids, which is going to be problemsome, I imagine. But if being short has been an issue for you, it can now be fixed in Las Vegas. Would you, would you do that surgery? No, if I'm going to get anything lengthened, it's not going to be my femurs. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if there was another part of your body, you could add no, three inches. Would you no. shut down your life for six months? No, that that's to me, <laughs> to me, to me, I'm just not that insecure about myself to have to, no. to think, to think that I need to go feel taller. One of my jokes growing up was always, I'm going to get a full body tattoo. It's going to be me, but taller. <laughs> I'm five, eight. Okay. Which that's, isn't that short, which no, isn't that short. I'm not, like, no, I'm short. I'm I'm a I'm a short guy, um, but I'm not the shortest guy on the planet. Dalton but, Tumlin might be. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I think five eight. Like I would. I, I mean, I'm assuming most of the people that get this. Like you go to their website, dude. I went. I got went down a mole hole one day in this, and I was reading people's <laughs> testimonies and stuff like that. Like people. Like here's the weird thing, and it costs seventy five grand for each three inches, then the max they can do is six, right? And, you, and you're not guaranteed three. They hope for three. It might be two, you know, depending on how your bones stretch and how much pain you can take and the rehab process from the opioids that you're going to be on for the six months that you're stuck in bed. But, but supposedly skyrocketing business during um, COVID because all these people that wanted it were like, I just I need to be off. on Zoom calls and I can be yeah. stoned and be in <laughs> Zoom calls. So um, a skyrocketing business during during the COVID times. But everyone that got it now, they would be the ones on the website. I'm sure they wouldn't put the negative ones, but everybody raves about it. Everyone's like, it's so amazing to walk into that room and look down on people and stuff like that. I just it's so I'm not doing that. No, I'm not, I would never even consider that. That's not happening to me. That's not happening. I'm going to raise my children to be confident kids. Hopefully they're not, you know, they don't have that problem. You know, people with the Napoleon syndrome have that problem. Need to go get their femurs broken. <laughs> do, you should, think the, I, do you think those walleye dudes, if, I don't know how tall they are, but do you think they'd be the kind that would go if get, it, deal if with it, that? If it made them money, probably. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> 
I, that's cheating. A, that's cheating in life. You are who you are. I, this is my firm belief. Whether it's boob jobs, penis lengtheners, femur <laughs> leg stretchers, or whatever it is, or lead weights do. in your walleye lead weights in your walleye you're cheating life you are who you are you catch what you catch be happy with yourself that's what's the problem with the world in the first place it's not you know from a political perspective it's not that we're not the problem for other people you have to look within yourself my mom had the greatest quote ever and i quoted her this on her birthday a few uh, weeks ago she says and she's told me this from day one that i could understand english as a child she said to be a beautiful person on the outside you have to be a beautiful person on the inside and i and i to this day hold that as an ethos and mantra in my life because you are who you are and you can't do anything well apparently you can go to las vegas and do something about that but <laughs> you know, be happy, man. Just freaking be happy, dude. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's foolish. It's foolish. It, um, uh, but I get it. I mean, I'm sure that that's the lottery of life. I mean, there's people who like, who was that dude last year? The short dude from the Bronx or something that became a big deal. The, the bagel guy that was screaming at people had like a huge complex, but he was a shorter guy and he had, that's what it all came back to. But it's just, I mean, it, it, it is what it is. Enjoy have life. You, have you seen the guy on Instagram who has, he's, he's an amputee from his waist down. And he, he's a, he's a, uh, he's an African American guy with, he's shredded. He works out constantly. That dude like can do anything. I mean, it's un, not anything, but unbelievable what that guy has done. And that's a testimony to uh, this is a tangent but it's kind of similar i mean he he got cheated in life right yeah he, he could feel like he got cheated in life clay dyer clay exact dyer same. exact same thing man they made the best of it and i'm sure they go to bed some nights thinking wishing why me because they can't do everything they want to do but they can do more than what other people can normal yeah. people can and I think that's a testimony to, you know, reaching down inside your gut. And if you're not a good enough walleye fisherman to be the team of the year, don't stuff lead weights in your fish because that's bullshit. Yeah. And just be happier with the person that you are because you're living somebody. I just stabbed myself with this pen trying to flip it. Uh, but but everybody, you're living people's dreams. And, and that is the truth. Like we we really do have a good life and uh, just be happier with this person you are. Don't live in the filtered. That's the other thing that's ridiculous. Filtered females stop using filters, especially the ones that are called no filter. Oh. Oh, <laughs> because when you show up at Starbucks and you're not, don't look like the same person, you know, stop, stop. stop. It, it's all dude. I used them. this past week. I saw a friend of mine had this filter thing and I was like, what would I look like with the filter? I had a cut on the end of my nose. The cut went away, dude. The cut disappeared. Like my everything was smooth, and I'm like, well, no wonder you use this because you build an unrealistic. I just think the world is messed up. It's fake. We live in a fake world all the way around, dude. Everything. Every, that's why I've said I've often said, Dave, and this goes back full circle to the conversation about this project about BASS and Ray Scott. One of the things that I really love about my job with JM associates slash Bassmaster is the group of people that we get to be around. And that is contagiousness from the people that, that, that Ray Scott hired early on the Helen Severs, the, the Bob Cobbs, all those people that has been handed down over time. And the whole reason why it's so professional and why we feel so good around each other as a group is because of that. The, the very first hirings, the people that he hired, hired the right people. Those people hired the right people. And here we are. Yes. People get, you know, get, get cold out of the system from time to time. But for the, for the most part, it's, you know, selfless people that are there to make this a great production, to create the values that were instilled in Bass from the very beginning. And that's why we feel the way we do about each other. I truly believe that. Yeah, it's uh, 
the dream is still the same dream that started in an insurance worker's desk way back in the day. But uh, live a more real life. And um, what, what do you got? What, what What's ahead for you, Jake? I leave. What is today? Monday? I leave Friday for the Lake Hartwell Open. Nice. And then I come back. I actually am shooting a project for the Bass U um, in Texas with Lee Livesey the following week. Then I go to um, Sam Rayburn for the Open in Jasper, Texas. And then the last Open. That's the last Open. There's two more. Yeah, two more. Okay. And then after that, I will be seeing you in November at the Redfish Cup. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That'll be in uh, Port Aransas, Texas, right? That's looking right. forward to it. Yeah, I missed it yeah. last year um, because of some other obligations with one of my uh, outfitting companies, but I'm no longer associated to that company. And I, I've, that's the first time I've ever said this publicly. <laughs> um, I'll explain later, but um, I'm going to... Uh, be at the redfish cup and i'm really looking forward to it because last year looked like a ton of fun yeah great do you know great any of the, do you know of any of the elites that are going to be competing yeah paul nick's there um of course zaldane will be there with ryan rickard trying to defend their title and um, Patrick walter's coming back patrick i think patrick's there i believe that scott martin's there i believe that well, I'm, I believe there's some others, but uh, I'm trying to cool. remember who they are. You put me on the spot. That makes so. it better. That ma- To me, that just makes it better because the bass world knows these guys. They're in Drew a Cook. different element. Drew, Drew Cook's Cook. coming, I think. Yeah. Sweet. And maybe Wes Logan. Sweet. I can't yeah. wait. I cannot wait. That's I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. But in between now and then, we're both going to have to answer a lot of questions about two idiots that shoved weights in a walleye. Don't do that, kids. It's dumb. It's dumb. The other thing is dumb is high heel shoes. Ladies, in mud. no guy on earth, no man on earth for the most part has ever looked at and said, I wish she was a little taller. Isn't that not the truth? Trust me. Trust (laughs) me. Yeah. (laughs) You want to hear another story? <laughs> well, sure. I'll, I'll make it quick. I'll make it quick. In junior high school, I was the captain of the football team in eighth grade. And on homecoming, I had to escort the homecoming queen out into the center of the football field during the homecoming ceremonies. And she was about four to five inches taller than me. And people were laughing and people thought it was cute. I mean, I'm what, 12 years old at the time. <laughs> And everyone thought it was cute. And all the moms were up there laughing. And, you know, again, they were talking about how cute it was. But I did get subconscious at that time about what, why they were laughing or why they were smiling at me because I thought she was taller than me. Since then, I've never, ever dated another, another girl, which she wasn't my girlfriend at the time. But I've never dated a girl taller than me because I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> You're traumatized from it. PTSD, man. PTSD. Oh. Well, I mean, but look me in the eye. I'm not insecure. About this. <laughs> God, you look like a total psycho right there. <laughs> I, know. Uh, I believe you'll be going to Vegas. He'll be going to, he'll be showing up <laughs> at the classic next year. Six, two. I did both. <laughs> oh, everybody's going to be like, dude, did you get your hair cut or something? How weird would you look though, too? Because you're adding six inches, but just on your lower body. So you're just like you still got the exact same length of torso. You know what would you know what happened? (laughs) I'd like hit my head on. I'd hit my head like on the airplane and stuff getting on. I'd start hitting my head because I'm not used to it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you just instantly Uh, complain about the seats and everything. This is ridiculous. It might work for those short guys, but (laughs) I'd start making fun of short people. You get my big uh, long legs in here. I turn into one of the biggest assholes ever. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, well. Um, uh, like I say about my hairline, I'm just bald to give other people a chance. And I think the same thing's true with you, my friend. If you were six <laughs> one, I mean, no other guys would have a chance in life. Oh, you, they, you they, dominate everything. Oh, they'd be scared to death. <laughs> 
Hey, just imagine, imagine this, Dave. At the beginning of this show, we were trying to figure out since normally I come from we come from an event, so we talk yeah. about the event. And we're like, okay, well, let's just go with it. Let's start out with the walleye guys and and go with it. And this has been one of the longest ones we've ever done. Yeah. Well, nonstop. Long. Not as long as a Vegas leg, but long, <laughs> long and heavy. Long and heavy. <laughs> that was a very heavy conversation. <laughs> well, I always enjoy talking with you, Jake. And um, likewise. It's always good to have you here. We'll have you back here uh, very soon in the future. Unless people don't want to hear from you outside of tournaments. Yeah. Let us know in the comments. I mean, maybe know. maybe Jake's take's Jake's not relevant take. anymore. No, I think they probably will vote me off the island. and <laughs> It'll be like, hi, I'm Jake. Welcome to a show named Mercer because of the guy that we voted off the island. <laughs> you know what I just noticed in your picture to your what? left? The uh -huh. race got. Yeah, that's Ray me Scott and Ray picture. Scott when I was. I see that. Much younger, and th and if we keep turning, that's me and Ray at wow. the very first at my very first classic, wow. which is really cool. Um, wow. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff up there. My wife, I got back from an event once. Look at all those frames up there. If you can see wow. any of them, it's ridiculous. Wow. So I came back, and my wife like put all that stuff up there, and. Um, I don't really like it to be honest. And now she's going to know Well, she kind of knows. Cause I'm like, I don't like pictures of me. I mean, the picture of Ray's cool and everything, but I just don't like pictures that I'm in, uh, but she worked really hard on it. So. Well, I mean, look at this stuff. It's There's nice. the Bass story by Bob Cobb. Bob Cobb's book is up there. Yeah. Yeah. All the bobbleheads. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah. there's good stuff there. Do you have nothing else to do? I mean, I've tried to close this show for 20 minutes and you keep coming up with new stories. Is your kid going to come in and do the one minute Rubik's cube for us They're today? At school. They're school No, but we got to do that next. We time. have to. He, Dude, that is insane. awesome. Oh, he's insane. One minute, 17 seconds is his personal best. And now he's what is doing the like world record for that. Do you know? Six seconds, six and a half seconds with one hand. Shut no up. Kid. I'm you go look it up on YouTube right now. They're putting There's, lead weights in that friggin' Rubik's yeah, cube. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 12. How can seconds. that even happen? Like. They make special ones that that uh, that are faster. They spin on a on bearings or something, and they have a competition. Um, and the guy that won it's like Chinese or he, he's Asian, and he literally has one hand on a grip like under the table, and he gets fifteen seconds to look the Rubik's cube over, and then he has to set it down. He can keep his hand above it, but he can't touch it. And then when the buzzer goes off, he grabs it and he goes. Shh, 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 shh. Six seconds, he, he does it. Unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable. So is your kid trying to get faster, or is he happy with oh, 117? Yeah. Oh, no. Matt, so his school, he started a trend. So now, like, people are bringing Rubik's Cubes to school, and they're having competitions on the playground. And, like, he started it at his school. Yeah. Wow. So if Rubik's Cubes make a huge comeback, then with I want kid. some royalty. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, we're not cheating for money. We're just going to figure out how to get it. <laughs> I feel like a total loser right now. Just so you know, because you're how old is your son? Eight. He's eight. He can do the Rubik's cube. Something that I have yet to accomplish in my life without pulling the stickers off. <laughs> yeah. Or breaking I, it apart and forcing it back together. Well, when I was a kid, I used to peel them. Like I took the time to peel them all off and put them, but you could tell I cheated at it. I never got to, I never got the, I've, Yet to this day, I've never done a Rubik's Cube fully. I mean, I've there got, I've got I can get a few. How are, you said that one day you roasted, you posted, my son is writing an algorithm for the Rubik's Cube. And I was like, Jake's lying about his kid again. Mm -mm. I've got, I, I saved, I saved it. He wrote it down on a piece of paper with a pencil and he wrote the algorithms down, which you can learn, but you still have to recognize where you are in the puzzle to fit the algorithm like counting cards or knowing what to play on when there's five people at a blackjack table and you look at everyone's hands that are exposed, you know what to play because you've, you, you understand the, the, the algorithms in, in what hand you're supposed to play to win that game. It, it's in, and at eight years old, I'm like, dude, I don't care if there are algorithms. That's ridiculous. He, he's a very smart kid. 
that's incredible to me. I mean, I literally want to hit my kids, to be honest, right now. Right now, when my kids get home from school today, I'm just going to be like, I love you, children. That's what I'll say. But really, would it kill you to do the Rubik's Cube in a minute 17? (laughs) (laughs) Tiffany Polinick is just, she was the first one. Like, I posted it. He did one, I don't know, way back, like before Lake Kauai. And he did one and it took him like three minutes or something. Uh-huh. She, when I, I went to Brandon's camp to just to chat and say hi. And she came out of the trailer and she, the camper. And she's like, the first thing she said was, Oh my God, what your son did with that Rubik's cube, like the focus that he has in this, like you can see him focused and, and, and just the, 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 the motivation to do that was incredible. And so when he did it minute, 17 seconds in that restaurant, you should have seen the people around us and all the tables were like, they're all staring at my kid doing this Rubik's cube. It was pretty cool. It was a very proud dad moment. Yeah. It's incredible. I, Charles Sim, who is, uh, before Corey, Chris and Gus, he showed up on the elite series. He was the second Canadian to ever qualify for the Bassmaster classic. The first one late Hank Gibson, but Charles could do it in three minutes. And I thought that was so impressive. And after, I, I've always said, I'm going to get you on the podcast to do it, Charles, but it turns out you're not coming on because Jake's kid does it in a minute 17. So brush up on your Rubik's cube skills. Um, wow. This podcast has gone many, many different directions. Let us wow. know if you guys like any of them. Jake, are you going to, are you going to end this? I mean, we can't even do an ender now. Just tell Bob Cobb to take it away. Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like comment and subscribe because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to, you hear?